just before lunch, we were talking about an idea of optimal model specification. And it was based upon the notion that we want to try hard not to condition on things we don't know are actually true. And so that suggests a definition in which we try to make sure that the only things we condition on are things that are actually known to be true by the nature of the context of the problem you're working on and the uh, data gathering process. Um, this does seem hard to achieve, but there are some examples in which it works. And uh, I wanted to produce a thorough file of all such examples for you, and I didn't quite finish that for today's meeting, so I'm going to bring that to you next time. Um, I'll give you one example. I'll remind you of one example in which we already know the setting in which it works. So you recall from De Finetti's theorem some weeks ago that the story went like this. Um, if you are watching a bunch of binary outcomes with no covariates, and the science of the problem renders the judgment on your part that your uncertainty about the y sub i's is exchangeable, then that corresponds directly by De Finetti's theorem. So this here is De Finetti's theorem, representation theorem, to the hierarchical model that the yi's given theta have to be regarded as iid Bernoulli theta. And theta uh, is a draw from some prior distribution. And I can put in the background information, of course, as I always should, data given background. So um, if you look at that, um, that's an example of the, exactly the sort of thing I have in mind. Because the only assumption you're making, namely exchangeability about your uncertainty about the yi's, was driven directly by the problem context. And then what comes out of it automatically is one and only one sampling distribution. And so this assumption came from problem context. And what we end up with is a unique choice of sampling distribution. And remember, the whole idea here is to try to come up with a way to specify the prior and the sampling distribution and the action space and the utility function in ways that are driven only by problem context and the nature of the data gathering process. So here's an instance where um, if it's true about your situation, like it was for us some weeks ago when I was talking about trying to predict the um, death and non-death um, status of those people um, with heart attack diagnosis at the Dominican hospital, um, if it's true that you know nothing about them, then the problem context drives the judgment of exchangeability about your uncertainty. And that, in turn, forces by De Finetti's theorem that you have to have one and only one sampling distribution. So that's an example of a problem in which um, problem context alone and the design of the data gathering process have rendered um, a, a unique sampling distribution. And therefore, there's no model uncertainty with respect to what you should be putting there in the part of the model. Of course, this does not force one particular prior distribution on you as opposed to another one. Uh, it only forces one particular sampling distribution. And that's as it should be, because different people will have different amounts of background information external to the data set about what theta is. And so they should be free to put in that information through the prior. But everybody who's uncertain about the whys is exchangeable in that problem with the, the heart attack patients at the Dominican hospital some weeks ago. All of those people are driven to one and only one sampling distribution. That's, what I, that's a simple example of what I mean by optimal model specification, because then what has happened is that um, of the four ingredients that we're trying to figure out what to do about, the prior, down at the bottom of page 25, the prior and the sampling distribution, the action space, and the utility function, well, the last two don't come up because we're only doing inference. And of the other two, one of them is really draw, driven directly by problem context and not requiring any sort of fiddling around in the data to see what to do. That is an example of optimal model specification. And here on page 27, um, this uh, goal does seem hard to achieve uh, in general, although I've just shown you a simple example in which it, it is achievable. Uh, for instance, in the uh, in-home geriatric assessment case study, visualizing the data set before it arrives, as we did back on, on page 3, we're thinking about what data we're going to get. Um, 
and it's certainly true that the problem context and the design make this table shell something that you can condition on. And it's also true, it was true about this study, that there weren't any previous trials within home geriatric assessment. So the lack of previous trials uh, implies that you can also condition on a diffuse choice for the, your prior distribution um, that, we, uh, were, that we needed to work with in order to learn about the relative improvement um, in hospitalization rates. And of course, with 572 observations, it won't matter very much how this diffuseness is specified. But the deal is that in this problem, context and design don't seem to have anything to say about the sampling distribution. Basically, we're regarding those counts, n sub c0 up to n sub ck and n sub t0 up to n sub tk. We're regarding them as things that we would like to know, or at least like to know the distribution of them in order to be able to say something careful about theta. But there's nothing in the problem context that forces you to pick one particular sampling distribution or another. Um, they are, in, in fact, um, counts of relatively rare events. And so you could try to say that the problem context is forcing a Poisson distribution on you. But we know that's not true. Because in our model, when we actually built the model for the data, we found that the Poisson was a bad model for the data. Because um, it would only be the case that, that um, the Poisson is a good model for accounts of rare events if every single person in the control group had the same underlying propensity to get hospitalized, the same lambda. And we know that that's quite unrealistic, because people differ from each other in things like how old they are and how sick they are with other, with other diseases and so on. So basically, context and design don't always force one particular sampling distribution upon us. We have to figure out some other way of specifying the sampling distribution. Well, we already know one way. It's the method I called the cheating approach, right? We look at the data and see what good, a good model is, and we go from there. And we've already agreed what the basic problem with that is. We're using the data twice when we do that. So why not do something like some of you have mentioned to me previously, namely, why not partition the data into subsets and use one of the subsets to fiddle around and look around for a model and use the rest of the data to see whether the model's any good or not? In other words, this moves us toward a Bayesian version of cross-validation. And that's one of the three methods I'm going to show you today for how to cope with model uncertainty. Uh -huh. Yeah, K just represents the largest number of hospitalizations any one particular person experienced. Um, well, there has to be, when, when the data are gathered, we're going to know that there has to be a, a largest number of hospitalizations that any one person experienced. And ahead of time, if you think about it, it's, it's unreasonable to suppose that K would be as large as 100, for example. It would be pretty amazing to have some, somebody have 100 hospitalizations in two years. So when we're done gathering the data, there, will just, there just will be some number K, and we don't know it ahead of time. And whatever it is, that will tell us how long each of those count vectors are in the control and treatment groups. Yes, the optimal statement allows conditioning on this table shell. We can certainly think, we can say ahead of time, we know that there is going to be a biggest hospitalization, because it's a finite world that we're in, and you can't be hospitalized um, an infinite number of times in two years. Um, and so whatever that number is, let's call it k. And that tells us that um, we're interested in knowing those numbers n sub c0 through n sub ck, and n sub t0 through n sub tk. So. Yes, please. OK, the, uh, he asked, uh, how do we know that using the data to specify the model by searching through the model space, why does that automatically give rise to narrowing of the, or rather, it makes the uncertainty bands narrower than they should be? It's basically for the reason I mentioned earlier. Um, if I take my data and I use that to completely specify the prior, for example, in this problem here, um, suppose I um, take my data set of n observations and I think of it as like having been generated from a beta distribution. And I look at the data to work out what the parameters of the beta are. And I stick that in as my prior. And then I write down the likelihood that's based on exactly the same data set. And so that would be like exactly using the data twice, once in the prior phase and once in the data phase. And that would be identical to an analysis in which you used a diffuse prior here, but you had a data set that was twice as big as the one you have now, just taking the data set and replicating it twice. And so we can tell that's the wrong thing to do from a Bayesian point of view. Um, the, the whole idea behind the prior was to specify all of the information about theta that was external to the data set. But in, instead, what's happening when we have, um, when we have uh, 
model uncertainty is that we're, um, the usual approach where we cheat involves using the data to specify some subset of the model space that we're going to focus on. Let's say that the data are Gaussian or whatever they might be. Um, and then we're using the same data to try to learn about the parameters in that Gaussian model. And uh, all of us in the room by now have a something for nothing bell um, that's built into our heads. And I, I encourage you to hear the something for nothing bell ringing. <laughs> When I, when I suggest the idea that it's okay to use the data to pick the model and then also use the same data to, to, uh, uh, to update uncertainty about the parameter based on that model. So we need to try to do something better, and let's see what that something better might be. So we're, we're having trouble figuring out what to do. Um, and I, as I say here at the top of page 28, this is where a good set of principles starts to help. And so in the rest of this presentation, I'm going to, as a small contribution to closing the gap between ad hoc practice and lack of theory, I'm going to focus now, I'm sorry, thank you, I'm going to focus now on four principles. And the first one, let's call, agree to call the calibration principle. And what it says is, in model specification, I'll put it in, uh, in uh, first person, I, I should pay attention to how often I get the right answer, because that's a basic scientific imperative. And a good way to do that is to create situations in which I know what the right answer is and then see how often my methods recover known truth. An example of doing that was exactly in the Brown and Draper paper. We created a simulation world where we knew what the right values were of the parameters. We gathered the data. We, we generated the data exactly from a particular mechanism that was known. And then we noticed that the, the quasi-likelihood methods were very badly out of calibration, whereas the Bayesian methods were well calibrated. Um, and so. The reasoning behind the calibration principle goes like this. Um, we have a new axiom. Uh, I hope you would agree with me that it's reasonable to assume that each of us in the room here want to help positively advance the course of science, and repeatedly getting the wrong answer runs counter to this desire. I hope you'd agree with me about that. Um, and um, the problem with that is that um, when you look at the nature of the Bayesian story, there's nothing in the Bayesian paradigm that prevents you from making one or both of the following mistakes. You might, for instance, choose the sampling distribution badly, or you might insert very strong information about theta external to the data set into the modeling process, and then find out after the fact that that information was badly out of step with reality. You, you are, you're allowed, under Cox's theorem, to, put in, to make either of those mistakes, because he doesn't say what to put in for your prior. He doesn't say what to put in for your sampling distribution. Of course, frequentists have the same problem with A. They don't put in B, but they don't have a problem with B, but they have the same problem with A. And anyway, there's nothing in the Bayesian paradigm to prevent you from making these mistakes, and repeatedly doing this violates the axiom that I just, sent you, just mentioned. So we ought to pay attention to calibration, because we all want to help positively advance the course of science, or if, if you're um, uh, largely interested in trying to make sure that the business you're involved in runs better. You want to help positively advance the course of your business, for example, and repeatedly getting the wrong answer also runs counter to that desire. So you could replace the word science with business or anything you, uh, any other um, endeavor, and you're going to come up with the same principle. Paying attention to calibration is a natural activity from the frequentist point of view, but um, a desire to be well calibrated, it turns out, can be also given an entirely Bayesian justification. And it goes by a decision theory like this. Um, I can take a broader perspective over my career, not just within any single attempt to solve one particular problem in collaboration with other people. And I can ask myself, over the scope of my whole career, my desire to take part positively in the progress of science or business can be quantified in a utility function that incorporates a bonus for me, for being well calibrated. And in this context, and I have a master's student named Colin Southwood um, with whom I'm working on this, calibration monitoring then emerges as a natural and inevitable Bayesian activity. And I'd like to take a moment to show you a flavor of what I'm doing with this guy, Colin Southwood. So I have some R code that we can look at. And I also posted for you a copy of um, his um, master's dissertation, uh, which is still in progress. So uh, I'm back to the course web page. I'm going to click on, on Southwood Collin. He's writing a master's thesis called Statistical Calibration via Bayesian Decision Theory. And it basically helps show how decision theory can, can uh, encourage Bayesians to pay attention to, to um, calibration issues. <clears throat> 
So let's have a look at his story. Um, you might enjoy reading the first part of this. He and I have worked out an introduction that essentially um, tells a story like the one that I've just been telling you today. And so it says these things in yet a slightly different way. And so you could find that that might be a nice thing to reinforce what we're doing today. Um, and um, uh, he and I say together, um, you've got these four components to your model. So you have four different types of model uncertainty. You have prior uncertainty, sampling distribution, slash likelihood uncertainty, and, like, and action space uncertainty, and utility function uncertainty. He's focusing on uh, sampling distribution uncertainty here. And uh, he points out that um, the cheating method can be described in the following way. People sometimes solve the problem about um, uh, model specification for the sampling distribution. And I'll put solve in quotes by the following three steps. So first, you perform descriptive summaries on the data in D to suggest a parametric form for the sampling distribution, where eta is a vector of parameters that either includes the thing you care about the most, theta, as one of its components, or else is such that theta is a function of the components of that vector. So for an example of, of Roman numeral 1, suppose the data vector is just our usual sample y1 through yn of real valued um, uh, quantities. And uh, suppose the model is that the yi's, if you knew what mu and sigma squared were, would be um, iid normal mu and, and sigma squared. And here, the unknown quantity of principal interest is often theta, which is just equal to mu. And so the, the eta vector has the components mu and sigma squared in it, but we just pick out one of them, and that turns out to be theta. And as an example of, um, of uh, version 2, Let's again take a one sample with real valued values one through y1 through yn. But now, suppose the sampling distribution is uh, iid from a gamma distribution, for example. And there's two ways, as we've seen, to parameterize the gamma. I'm thinking of the one in which the mean of the data it comes out alpha over beta. Then the unknown quantity might be something like the sampling variance, which is alpha over beta squared. And that's some function of the two parameters. Um, uh, OK, it looks like there's a mistake there. It should be yi given alpha and beta, not mu and sigma squared. That's a typo. Um, and so here, the eta vector is the, is the numbers alpha and beta. And it's not that theta is in that vector. It's just that it, theta is a function of those quantities. So first, we perform descriptive summaries on the data to suggest a parametric form of the sampling distribution. Then we pretend that that sampling distribution was known to be the correct sampling distribution all along. And then finally, we draw inferences and make predictions by estimating the parameter vector in that model using the same data set for the estimation that we used to specify the model in the first place. Um, elsewhere, I have written about this. Um, there's a paper that, uh, that I've posted on the web page that you might well find uh, interesting. It's rather old by now, but it uh, contains a lot of good ideas about how to think about model uncertainty. And it shows you how to do something called Bayesian model averaging, which we're going to look at as, a, as one example of coping with model uncertainty. And in this paper, I called uh, this cheating approach the S star approach, because S is, uh, it stands for the structure of the model, for example, IID normal or IID gamma or whatever. And like I say in this paper here, a widely used approach involves enlisting the aid of the data to specify a plausible single best choice, S star, for the structure, and then proceeding as if F star were known to be correct. And, and in general, we know this fails to assess and pass along or propagate uncertainty in the structure of the model fully and may lead to miscalibrated uncertainty assessments about the thing you care about given the data that you've seen. So um, back here in Collins' world, he says, like I did in that paper, let's agree to call this the S-star approach for so-called discovering, quote, the structure of the model. And so with this method, you use the data to examine a variety of model structures, S1, S2, dot, 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 and then you pick your favorite one and pretend that that was right all along. Clearly, this doesn't help you to identify how much uncertainty you have about the structure, the sampling distribution, because you're pretending you don't have any at all. right? You're, you just look around and pick one and then pretend that you knew all along that that was right. So a better uh, strategy involves the concept of two-way cross-validation. And to take a simple example, uh, in which as be before the data set is just a vector y1 through yn of real numbers, the idea is to partition the data, capital D, into two non-overlapping and jointly exhaustive sets, which I'll call the modeling subset and the validation subset. And I'll refer to the modeling subset as capital M and the validation subset as capital V. So the picture we have in our minds is of the data set acting like a blob 
and I'm going to take the data and I'm going to partition it into modeling part, the modeling compart, component and the validation component. So this is the whole data set, and I partition it in that way. Um, now you have some freedom because now you can do the cheating thing, but only on the modeling part of the data, right? You can now hunt around in the modeling part to look for a good model structure, and then after that, um, you can use the data uh, and the model you picked in the modeling part and see how well it validates in the validation part. So that's the idea behind, uh, I'm going to call this approach um, two-way cross-validation because we've partitioned the data set into two components. And so to get back to Collins' narrative, now you can perform that cheating step earlier, but now it's not going to be cheating. Um, and I think, I think I probably told you my uh, chocolate cake analogy a few weeks ago. Um, let me remind you of it. Um, when we have model uncertainty, um, there seem to be two ways to cope with it. One is to try to find a way to analyze the data that explicitly acknowledges the model uncertainty in the entire modeling process. And the other way is to try to cheat in the way people often do, but also pay the right price for having cheated. And my analogy a few weeks ago was, uh, I'm trying to lose weight, and I see a piece of chocolate cake I really like the look of, and it has 500 calories worth of energy in it, and I have two ways to proceed. I could either not eat the chocolate cake, which would serve my goal of not taking on board those 500 calories, or I could eat the chocolate cake and then go right down to the gym and, and exercise off 500 calories worth of, of energy. And nutritionists have shown that you have to give your body a day or two to recover from the whole process, but... Um, in fact, those two methods are identical for staying on the progress of my diet. Either don't eat the chocolate cake at all, or else eat it, but then pay the price for having eaten it by going down to the gym and exercise it off. And so that's what we're doing here. Either we can figure out a way to solve the model uncertainty problem that doesn't involve eating the cake at all, namely some way to build a model that's somehow so big that all the different possibilities could live inside it, and then we wouldn't have to cheat and look around for the right model. And that's what Bayesian nonparametrics tries to do. Or we can apply the cheating approach and use part of the data to look around for the best model. That's like eating the chocolate cake. But then we use the rest of the data to see how good that model was. And that's like paying the price. Because when you're done with this approach, of course, um, really, strictly speaking, the only part of the data you should use for drawing your conclusions is the modeling part. You've had to leave the other part out to see how good your modeling was. And so you have a smaller sample size now for inference than you did before, and that's going to make your uncertainty bands wider by an amount that corresponds to going down to the, the, the gym and, and, and uh, uh, exercising off the chocolate cake. Um, it's perhaps not the, the uh, most exact analogy that one could come up with, but it has a flavor of it. So we either don't cheat at all or else we cheat but pay the right price. Those seem to be the only two approaches that, that we have. So two-way cross-validation. Now we have the M and the V subsets. Now we can perform the cheating step upon the data in M. We can hunt around for what appears to be a good sampling distribution specification. And then when we find such a specification that seems to work well, we can see how well it validates on the data in V. Seems like a good idea. And one way to do this validation exercise is to construct posterior predictive distributions using only the data in M for the data values in V, and then seeing if these predictive distributions match the reality in V reasonably well. And I'll need to show you methods for making that comparison between the actual values and the predictive distributions for them um, uh, formal. But, pardon? Please. Yes. Um, you're asking a really good question. One of the practical implementation questions in this strategy, this two-way cross-validation strategy, is just exactly how big a price should I pay for not knowing what the right model is? And that corresponds to answering the practical question, how much of the data should I put in the modeling part, and how much should I put in the validation part? Um, and you can see there's a direct tug of war there, because if I put almost all of the modeling, uh, almost all of the data in the modeling part, then I get a pretty good idea of what a good model is for the data, but I don't have enough information to find out whether that model validates very well on new data. At the other extreme, if I put hardly any data into the modeling part, 
I get a really good idea of how well that model validates, but it probably is going to model validate it very poorly because I used a tiny amount of the data to build it in the first place. So there's a kind of tension here, and we ought to be able to use um, utility theory involving maximizing expected utility to decide how much data to put in each part based upon those two competing concerns. We want our interval estimates and our predictive intervals based on the M part to be narrow, but we also want them to be well calibrated. And we have to put, be prepared to put enough data into the V part to get a good idea of what's going on, both from a modeling point of view and a calibration point of view. So that, I think, is a, is a, is a good way to consider uh, how to move forward on this. And I'll show you um, some examples of that either today or, or next time. Um, Um, yes, people have tried that. Um, uh, leaving one observation out and then seeing what's going on with the other ones has a name in statistics. Oh, you're not doing that. Yes. Okay. Okay, so, so we start with an empty data set here, and now we take the first data point at random, and we just toss it into one of them at random, let's say. We put it into M, for instance. Then we actually try to model based upon one data point? Or, yeah. Okay, and you're not going to get very far. Um, and so um, you end up with a very wide uncertainty band about the things you care about and no information at all about how to see how well that validates. So now I take another data point and I toss it in. I ask myself which of those two uncertainty sources is bigger, and I decide maybe that this time I have to have at least one point in the validation part, so I throw that in there, and I go along sequentially like that. Um, that's an interesting idea. No one's ever done it before. Um, uh, that's an interesting idea worth probably worth pursuing. Um, the approach I'm going to share with you today has been looked at quite a bit, um, and I'm about to criticize it now. This is, gets used a lot. But uh, can anybody see what might be a difficulty about this? You use the data in the modeling part, and when you're done, you think you've got a good model, you go ahead and see how well it validates. And if it validates well, you announce to the world, I have a good model, and I also can show you it validates well. But there's a but in there somewhere. What's the but? <laughs> yeah, what if it doesn't validate well? Then what you want to do is go back and remodel and revalidate and iterate in this data set. You want to be able to go back and forth here, right? If it doesn't validate well, you want to go back and remodel and revalidate and remodel and revalidate and do that over and over again until you've really got something that seems to work. And then you realize you painted yourself into a corner because you don't have any data left over that hasn't been touched by this process to see how well you, the overall iterative process would work on, on new data. And so to me, that suggests an approach that has been advocated in machine learning for some years now, although not for this purpose. Um, namely, instead of partitioning the data into two subsets, let's, if, if life is like a Taylor series, which it is <laughs> in, in many ways, um, and if we've already gone out two terms in the Taylor series uh, and we're not happy yet, well, let's just go out another term. So now here's the data, and I'm going to partition into modeling and validation and calibration. And now this is the thing I'm going to call calibration cross-validation. And this is a new idea that, that uh, in the statistics literature, it's been used some in the machine learning literature, but not in the way I intend. So this is called calibration cross-validation. And I have some examples of it in the stuff I, I want to show you either today or next time. So now what you do is you model and you validate, and then you remodel and revalidate, and you're allowed to mess around like this as much as you want. And when you're done and you think you have either a model or an ensemble of models that um, do a good job, then you draw the line and you take the union of these two data sets here, the modeling plus the, the validation. You make one medium-sized data set out of that, and then you fit your, your model that really validates well to that whole part there. And then now what you can do with that model is both report on the inferential conclusions that you are most interested in, and then also try to see how well that model that was arrived at iteratively calibrates in the other, the other part of the data. So that is, this is a way to actually eat that cake, eat the chocolate cake, and have it too, so to speak. 
So, um, so returning now to Collins' narrative, we get to the but. So there's just one problem with this two-way cross-validation approach. What if you find, as is more often true than you'd like, that the model you found by hunting around in M doesn't validate well in V? The natural thing to try would then be to go back to M again and hunt some more for a new improved model that does validate well in V. And this might involve several iterations back and forth between M and V. Once you're done with this iterative process, however, you'll see that you've painted yourself into a corner. There are now no new additional data values untouched by the modeling process on which to see how well the entire iterative modeling process validates on fresh data. And so this line of reasoning has suggested to me um, calibration cross-validation. And so now here's a little version of this algorithm in five steps. First, partition the data into modeling, validation, and calibration subsets. And as usual, the partition means it's non-overlapping non and exhaustive, every, every data value. And by data value, um, I, I understand how this technique works for data sets that have the following structure. So there's n observations, and the rows in this data set we regard as conditionally exchangeable with each other given the covariate values that are present. So here's the y's over here, and here's x1 through xk, let's call it. Um, if you don't have any covariates at all, then you just have the one sample problem, like the NB10 data set that we've looked at already. But if you do have predictor variables, then this is a standard um, regression structure, where you're trying to use the x's to predict the y's. So this is standard regression structure. Um, and so by partition the data, I mean uh, you choose a random subset of some of the rows of this data set, and you put that in the modeling part. Then you choose a random subset of what's left, and you put that in the validation part. Then you take all the rows that are left and put them in the calibration part. So the randomization that, that partitions is corresponds to, in effect, choosing a random set of indices uh, for the rows here and stuffing each of the M and the V and the C subsets with the, with the relevant rows. That will make the partition both um, mutually exclusive on the one hand and also exhaustive. Then we use the modeling data set to explore a variety of models until we found one or more plausible candidates. And you can collect those models into an ensemble that I'll call script M, which consists of, let's say, uh, capital M1, model 1, down to capital M sub M for them. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm back over here again. So first we partition the data into modeling, validation, and calibration subsets. Then we use the modeling part to explore a variety of models. And we're going to have to face an issue um, pretty soon later today, which is as soon as you admit the possibility that more than one model might be OK for your data, then you have a choice. If you've identified two models, do you pick the best one and throw the other one away? Or do you somehow collect all of the models that are worth looking at into some sort of ensemble or collection? And if you've got the collection, what do you do with it? If you go along comparing a new model with an old one and throwing away the one that looks not as good, ending up with a single model, people refer to that as the model selection process. And your entire goal is to come up with one model at the end. That's not necessarily the best thing to do for all possible purposes might be better to keep a running track of all the models that seem like they might have some merit and collect them all into an ensemble, like the one right here, script M. And then you have to figure out what to do when you have the embarrassment of riches of having more than one model. What's the right thing to do from a Bayesian point of view? And that turns out to be a method called Bayesian model averaging, which I'll illustrate for you this afternoon. So um, uh, now that we have this ensemble, we can now, step C, see how well the models in the ensemble predictively validate in V. And if none of them do, we can go back and iterate steps B and C until we do get good validation. And then either fit the best model in M or use better, use Bayesian model averaging. Um, and I'll, I'll show you how to do that today with the entire ensemble M. You, you make a data set consisting of the union of the modeling plus the validation data. And then you get to report two different kinds of things, both inferential conclusions and predictive conclusions based on this model fit. And also, you get to report the quality of predictive calibration of your model or ensemble on the new data that hasn't been used. And we get two different things out of this, not just one, as the, the usual um, uh, thing that comes out of uh, ordinary um, uh, Bayesian or Frequentist modeling. We not only get a good answer to the main scientific question, and this turns out to be a, a good answer that has paid a reasonable price for model uncertainty,
because your inferential answer will be based only on the data in the modeling plus the validation parts, not the entire data set, and that will make your uncertainty bands wider than they would have been if you just tried to do that, that one model only analysis on the whole data set incorrectly. And then secondly, not only do you get a good answer that has paid a reasonable price for model uncertainty, but you also get an indication of how well calibrated the entire iterative fitting process yielding the answer in step one, how well calibrated that process is in, by, by turning it loose on the calibration subset. And we regard the calibration subset as a good proxy for future data, and so in effect we're trying to answer the question, how well does this iterative modeling process, how well do we expect it will perform on future data, which is a good question to ask. Uh -huh. Right at the beginning. Before any exploratory data analysis at all. And in fact, we, yes, um, I don't think that's a good idea from the point of view of trying to f pay the full price for model uncertainty. What my partners at Kaiser and I do routinely now is when we collect a big data set for some, some purpose of answering a, a, a medical or health policy question, we right away before doing anything else with it, after cleaning the data obviously, so making sure that the, the data values are reliable, right away we partition it in this three-fold fashion. And uh, we give the modeling part, we give only the modeling part to the analysts. What we like to do at Kaiser these days is that there are three different people, all of whom enjoy the modeling process, namely myself, and two of the analysts at Kaiser. And so we give all three of us the modeling data set only, and we, turn, they turn, we, we get turned loose on that data set for a few weeks or a month. Um, and then we are given the validation data set, and we're allowed to ask ourselves, have we done a good job with this model? Does it validate well? And we're given a little bit more time to go back and remodel and revalidate as necessary. And only when we have what we think each of us has as a good model will we then um, try to fit that model to the um, data in the model plus, modeling plus validation subsets and then see how the calibration goes. And at the end, everybody's done this in, independently and in parallel, but on the same exact data sets. And you have a way of discovering um, whether all decent uh, inferential roads have led to Rome, for example. And what we've been finding at Kaiser is that it's nice to have multiple heads thinking about the modeling process, but we often end up with models that are strikingly similar. So that gives us a kind of confirmation of stability in the modeling process. Another way to do it would be to not break the calibration code until you had pooled your results across all three analysts. And so each of us might have come up with a model that, that the others didn't think of. And when all the models are put together in a big union across all the models that all three of us thought of, we might end up with an even better model ensemble, which we could then try to validate in the validation part. We've also tried that in Kaiser projects, and that seems to work well as well. So yeah, we, we, we actually do this partitioning right before anything, any exploratory work has been done at all, because that gives you a chance to start paying the right price for, for the exploratory work as well as everything else. Um, okay, and so uh, Colin is working on the following practical question. How much data should you put in each of those subsets? And again, it represents a tension in each case. The more data I put in the M plus V part, the less data I have for calibration and vice versa. So we're using um, utility, Bayesian decision theory, to work out, um, to work out uh, how to um, uh, come up with an optimal um, uh, partition. Given that you only start with, say, little n data values, adopting the point of view that leads to this calibration cross-validation sets up a tug of war between the two competing desires in those items one and two previously. I want my inferences and predictions to be as accurate as possible, which means I want a large amount of data in the modeling plus validation data sets. But I also want to be able to assess how well calibrated that modeling process is, and that means I want a lot of data in the, in the, in the calibration part. I can't have them both, and so I have two competing desires. And so a natural way to, to resolve that tension is to put some measure of accuracy from each of them onto a common scale and try to maximize expected utility. So the utility function will have two components, one for accuracy of the inferential and predictive conclusions, and the other one will be accuracy for the calibration conclusions. And you try to make them, you try to make an, a reasonable trade-off between them. So as a warm-up for that, um, Colin, I encourage Colin to think about the following highly stylized 
version of a problem that would arise if you were trying to do weather forecasting. Suppose that you're a meteorologist who is asked to, on December 31st, at the end of the year 2014, to construct 95% predictive intervals for the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit at noon at the measuring station, let's say, on top of the building where you work, for each of the 365 days from January 1st to December 31st of the next year. You haven't seen any of that data yet. You're asked to make 365 predictive intervals, one for each day. Your boss wants your intervals to be accurate, so she offers you a bonus of capital B dollars if at least 95% of your 365 intervals include the actual temperature. But she also wants your intervals not to be any wider than necessary because you're no dummy. You realize that you can win the bonus just by giving her absurdly wide intervals, right? And so she subtracts money from your payout in a way that's driven by how wide your intervals are. And now, as a basis for your predictions, you have the noon temperatures Y sub I for each of the 365 days from January 1st to December 31st of the year you've seen so far, 2014. Let's call that data set Y, namely Y sub 1 through Y sub N and uh, underscore M. And you see I'm picking the symbols N sub underscore M and N sub V to stand for how much data you have in the modeling part and how much data you have in the validation part. To focus on the trade-off of interest in the simplest possible way, Colin pretends that the location at which the noon temperature is to be predicted is sufficiently close to the equator that this temperature is roughly constant every day. If it weren't, if it followed some kind of sinusoidal pattern, we could incorporate that with, but without much difficulty. But let's just get rid of that because it's, it's, a, it's a distraction. And so this, this temperature, the maximum temperature at noon, varies, let's say, in an approximately Gaussian way around its long-term mean theta with a known standard deviation sigma. With diffuse prior information about theta external to the data values that you have in 2014, you can use methods like the ones I've shown you earlier this, this uh, class to see that your Bayesian posterior predictive intervals for each of the noon temperatures in 2015 should just be of the form Y bar. You should take the mean of the data you have already and go some number plus or minus C either way. And so now we're setting a problem up where your action space consists of different choices of the number C. And you essentially are the person, the weather forecaster, you can pick that number C in a way that uh, optimally trades off your chance of getting the bonus on the one hand versus your chance, the amount of money you lose for building wide intervals. And so this, this embodies something quite a lot like the tension I was describing before between wanting the inferences to be accurate and also wanting them to be well calibrated. So um, we've noticed already previously that a sensible utility function here will have two terms that quantify the trade-offs, in this case between winning the bonus on the one hand and the width of the intervals that allow you to win, on the other hand. So let's let the actual temperature on noon temperature on day i be y i star. The first term in this utility function should look like this. It should be b dollars times the indicator function of the following statement. At least 95% of those predictive statements are true. In other words, the true y i star value falls within the bounds of my predictive interval. And I want at least 95% of those statements to be true where I, sub a, I of A is just the indicator function, it's one if the proposition A is true and zero otherwise. Now, how would your boss reasonably uh, quantify your, the widths of your intervals? Well, suppose she adds up the widths of all your intervals, obtaining thereby a quantity in degrees Fahrenheit, and then multiplies that sum by a weight W that was calibrated in dollars per degree Fahrenheit that measures the strength of the penalty for having unnecessarily wide intervals. Here, in this highly simplified setting, you're going to be using the same interval, y bar plus or minus c for each day. So the sum of the widths of all your intervals across the 365 days is just 2 times c times how many of those days there are. And so putting all this together gives the following utility function. It's a function both of the c that you choose, namely um, what width you choose, and the unknown theta representing the actual um, uh, long run uh, mean temperature at noon. Well, it's going to be that first term minus a penalty for how wide the intervals are, which turns out to be the same number as before, 2C N times, 2CNV times um, W, which is the amount of weight your boss puts on uh, making your intervals wider than necessary. And so now that's our utility function, and we want to maximize expected utility where the uncertainty is over the posterior distribution for theta given Y. And a fun thing happens. It turns out that the, your uncertainty about theta doesn't even enter into this problem. Um, because 
uh, of a particular way that this, this um, process of, of predicting things is structured. So actually, in this case, all we have to do is maximize utility, not expected utility. I want to find the value of C that makes this as large as possible. But I do have to, no, I'm wrong. Um, I have to do an expected utility where the expectation is over this part here. And the expectation of an indicator function is always just the probability that that's true. So basically, I have to quantify the probability of getting at least 95% of the intervals to include the right answer as a function of C, and then subtract off this penalty for width, and, and I'm, I'm golden. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to fill that off for a minute because it got too big somehow and make that smaller as well and go back to the web page. I have for you down here in the R kind of stuff, um, here's a meteorological example to illustrate calibration via Bayesian decision theory. So here's some R code that demonstrates the trade-off between the calibration bonus on the one hand and the penalty based on the widths of the intervals on the other. So here we go. Um, so I'll grab this code and bring it over to, maybe I'll just, well, I'll just grab some of it now and put the rest in later. So I wrote a, an R function called expected.utility. It takes in as arguments the underlying sigma, which we're pretending is known, how much data there is in the modeling part, how big the bonus is, how much weight your boss um, uh, puts uh, against you as a penalty for having wide intervals, how much data there is in the validation part, what the nominal level of the predictive intervals is, for instance, 95%, and what value of C you should choose in order to try to get um, this to be as large as possible. So I run this code, and I pick out particular values of all five of those things. Let's say sigma is five, and um, there are 365 days in the modeling data set and 365 in the validation data set. And she gives you a, pen, a reward of $5,000 uh, for being well calibrated, but she subtracts off twice the width of your intervals times her, her penalty of 0.5 times the number of, of uh, days in the uh, validation data set. Well, let's see what happens. Very cool picture happens. Um, uh, in fact, you can guess what will happen just by using common sense. Before we run the code, it's always a good thing to try to figure out what the answer should be. And so here's going to be C going this way and U of C going this way. Clearly, if she sets her interval widths, um, the meteorologist sets her interval widths to zero, She's going to um, not have a penalty at all, but she's also not going to get the bonus. Now, if she makes her intervals really narrow, she's not going to get the bonus, but she is being penalized for the interval widths, and so she's going to start losing money for a while. And then what's going to happen? After the intervals get wide enough, she's going to start catching the bonus sometimes. And so this thing is going to turn the corner and start to rise, and in fact, it might rise pretty quickly as the probability of, of her winning the bonus increases. And if the bonus is big enough, it may rise to a place that's higher than over here. And then after a while, she has maxed out her chance of getting the bonus. It's now 100%. She wins the bonus each time. And so what happens after that? If she keeps going, it's going to go down again, right? Because she's going to be paying a price again for not knowing I mean, for, for making intervals that are unnecessarily wide. So you can actually work out intuitively what the right answer should be and then run the code and, and see. And in fact, bada bing. Oh, thank you. And so it looks just like you'd expect. And here's a pretty interesting thing. Um, with um, her, what, what's that? Um, but you see that, um, in fact, um, she can sit her out ahead of time and work out what the right thing is to do, and she can take home a thousand bucks. Now, where is the optimal value of C star? Well, we're trying to make this number here as big as possible, the number in the right-hand column. So what I have here is the C value I'm trying on and the expected utility here. And so it just gets worse for a long time. And then right around 10, 10, 10 degrees Fahrenheit, it starts to get dramatically better very quickly. And then it rises, it keeps rising to a maximum somewhere around 
well, you can see the maximum occurs right there at about 10.9 degrees Fahrenheit as the width of the interval left to right. Um, and then she starts losing money after that because her intervals are, are needlessly wide. And that number 10 point, uh, what was it, 10.9 is interesting because um, if you were just ordinarily trying to create 95% intervals without being awarded a bonus for, for, um, uh, for calibration accuracy, and the sigma was 5, and you're trying to predict what's happening next in a Gaussian process where the sigma is 5, then your intervals should be 5 times 2 or 5 times 1.96 wide, either direction pretty much. You don't have much uncertainty about the y bar with, all, with 365 observations. So you ought to really only be going about um, 10 degrees Fahrenheit either way, maybe even a little less than that, whatever 1.96 times, times, uh, um, times uh, 5 is, so 1.96 times 5. You should really only go about 9.8 either way. And yet, here's a very nice quantitative summary of, of the fact that Bayesians need to pay attention to how well calibrated they are. When they're offered a bonus for good calibration, they need to widen their uncertainty bands in order to be able to have a good chance of catching the bonus. And the right amount is kind of interesting. I'll now run the second part of the code, and you'll see uh, what I mean. Uh, instead of just dumping all those numbers out and having to sort, for, you know, hunt for the maximum, why not be a little more careful about it? There's that function in R called optim. Forget if we've talked about optim yet. Um, that uh, will do uh, one-dimensional optimization for. Actually, it'll do multi-dimensional optimization. You give it a vector of length k of a function that maps from k inputs down to one real number, and it will find the best for you. So let's go ahead and run the rest of this code. And what the code says, all I did was I rewrote the function so that it, it had only the um, C value as its input um, and used all the other variables as external. And what you see is that um, it does pick, correctly pick out that the optimal um, value of C is about 10.86, that number we saw before. But here's the interesting part. Um, that width corresponds to intervals that have, from the point of view of ordinary um, uh, Bayesian predictive intervals, actually have 97% uh, coverage. So in other words, in order to win the bonus, you have to be prepared to widen your intervals. And the interval, the amount that you should widen them corresponds to pretending that the intervals you're supposed to be building are 97% intervals in order to make sure you win the bonus at 95%. And I personally had no way of knowing how much bigger this, I knew this number had to be bigger than 95%, but I had no way of knowing how much bigger. And it's kind of interesting that it's not that much bigger. And of course, this is, gives you a structure to play around with all sorts of things. You can mess with the bonus and mess with the weight and see what happens and, and the, the things that you can imagine happen do. But there's a simple example where, where Bayesian decision theory can help Bayesians understand that it's worthwhile to pay attention to calibration. Namely, if you reward yourself over the course of your career, like the meteorologist rewarding herself over the course of that entire year's worth of predictions, with a bonus for being well calibrated during that time, then you will discover, A, that you're interested in keeping track of calibration as a Bayesian. And secondly, you're going to probably need to make your intervals a bit wider to make sure that you've got a model that really does predict well external to the data it actually has. So we see two qualitative lessons of model uncertainty coming out right here in, in this story. Yes, please. Yes. But you remember that um, she is allowed to make these calculations. She, the meteorologist, trying to, to decide how to behave. She's allowed to make these calculations at the beginning of the year before she says anything. Um, and you can see for yourself that uh, as long as her boss tells her what the, uh, the game is, how big the bonus is, and what the weight is against having unnecessarily wide intervals, she can work out what the optimal thing is to do, namely widen her intervals. And this tells her how much she should widen them by to have a good chance of collecting the bonus without making the intervals wider than necessary. It's really kind of there in that framework. 
Oh, you're one of those Minimax people. Um, so, um, so the the frequentists invented when they started thinking about decision theory. They invented a lot of ad hoc rules um, that did not involve averaging over posterior distributions because they can't a a average over posterior distributions because they're not allowed to think about prior distributions. So. Maximizing expected utility, where the expectation is with, is, is with respect to the posterior distribution, that's not within their remit. It's not possible. So they decided to create a whole bunch of ad hoc rules that, that got rid of the theta, but not by uh, integrating over the posterior. And one of their rules was called minimax. And basically it says, figure out the worst thing that could happen under all the different actions you could take, and then find the action that minimizes the worst thing that could happen. That's a, that's a famous um, um, Frequentist decision rule. Um, if you go around being minimax in your life over a long period of time, you will discover that it's the equivalent of paying a lot of insurance premiums that you didn't need to pay. And if I give you a fixed amount of, but, suppose, I, I, I have, suppose you're a scientist and you want to solve a whole bunch of problems over the next 10 years, and I give you a fixed budget of money to solve that with, those, all those problems with, and you're trying to get as many solved as possible. If you go around working on each problem in a minimax way, you will find that you have spent so much money insuring against things that don't actually happen or aren't very likely to happen that you'll run out of money too early and you won't have actually tackled enough problems. So if you look at the arc of your career over a bunch of decision problems, it just turns out to be better to maximize expected utility than to do some ad hoc thing is, that's another way to get rid of the theta, namely something like minimax. Um, so we were returning to this story here. Um, and in my search of the literature, um, the idea I'm sharing with you here seems to be new. So we start with, with Cox. Logical consistency justifies Bayesian uncertainty assessment but does not provide guidance on model specification. If you accept the calibration principle, some of this guidance is provided by a Bayesian decision theory through a desire on your part to pay attention to how often you get the right answer, which I claim is a central scientific activity no matter what flavor of probability you happen to prefer. But we discover that the calibration principle by itself is not enough. In problems of realistic complexity, we see that thing I mentioned before lunch, that you'll generally notice that A, you're uncertain about theta, but B, you're also uncertain about how to quantify your uncertainty about theta. In other words, you have model uncertainty. And Cox's theorem says that you can draw logically consistent inferences about an unknown theta if you're given data D and background information B by specifying those two ingredients. But the item B in the little list I just made implies that there will typically be more than one such plausible model. And so now, what should you do about this? Well, it sure would be nice if we could solve this inference problem by using Bayes' theorem to compute the thing that's in the middle of page 30. The posterior distribution for theta given D and the background information and conditioning on all possible models, which is like saying not having to think about the model at all, because when you condition on all possibilities, that must be true, right? But this turns out not to be feasible, because just as Kolmogorov had to resort to those sigma field things I told you about in the morning, because the set of all subsets of an omega with uncountably many elements is too big to meaningfully assign probabilities to all the subsets. With any finite data set, the set of all possible models for that data set is far too big for the data set to meaningfully um, provide you with plausibility assessments of all the models in there. And I will give a simple example of that um, after our break. Looks like we're, it's time for a break. So we'll take a 15-minute break now. Um, BC Ops will turn things off now and start again at 245. All right, let's begin again, please. BC Ops, it's 246 now. We're going to start again for another hour till 345. All right, so we just saw um, how it is that um, it's possible to um, pay attention to calibration from the, from the Bayesian point of view by thinking about utility and giving yourself a bonus for being uh, calibrated. Uh, now, right before the break, we were talking about the fact that uh, 
um, if you were honest about it, you would probably have to admit that in any given situation, um, there are a number of different possible modeling structures you could use to try to um, describe what's going on. Uh, and so as soon as you um, now um, admit the possibility that, um, oh, I know, I remember, I remember what I was going to do. Right before the break, I was going to tell you about an example of this situation with too many models. So um, let's consider, uh, I did switch. Oh, you're right. Now I have to switch back. Great. <laughs> um, so let's consider a, a Bernoulli sequence that's unfolding. Um, so here's the first one, Y1. Um, what are all possible models for that? Well, uh, the only possible models are um, it's either 1 with probability p and 0 with probability 1 minus p. And that means that the dimension of the models, possible models is 1. And so now let's make a little table. When n is 1, the dimension of the model, model dimension, model space dimension is 1. What happens when n is 2? Well, there's two ways that y1 and y2 could come out, either 1 or 0 and 1 or 0. And look, there's to fully specify the joint distribution, there's a number right there. I could call it p1 and a number right there, p2, and a number right there, p3. And then finally, everything else goes along after that. It has to go 1 minus p1 minus p2 minus p3. So with two observations, the dimensionality of the model space is 3, because there's three different numbers that could vary. All they have to be um, strictly between 0 and 1, but they, um, and they have to add up to, uh, I'm sorry, they just have to strictly be between 0 and 1, but that's a three-dimensional space. So actually make a little, I should start on a new page. So what we just saw is that when there's one observation, the dimensionality of the model space is 1. When there's two observations, the dimensionality of the model space is 3. And when there's three observations, um, you can see if I were to try to make something that acts like a cube um, that sits over top of this with the y1 and the y2 and the y3, that there's going to be, it turns out, seven different numbers that are possible. And you can see the pattern sort of going along. Um, this corresponds to uh, 2 to the n minus 1. This corresponds to 2 to the n minus 1. This corresponds to 2 to the n minus 1, doesn't it? Did I get that right? Um, and so basically, um, the number of possible models, as measured by something like the dimensionality of the model space, it grows faster than the number of data points. 2 to the n different dim dimensions of possibilities for the, for the model space vector when there's only n observations. And so, and that's only with, uh, with uh, dichotomous outcomes and no predictor variables. So this basically is a simple exercise that demonstrates that uh, the data will never be sufficient to work with really, really, really big model spaces because the set of possible models is always so much vaster than the number of data points you have that you can't get anywhere near that set of all possible models. So like it says there on page 30, the set of all possible models is too big for your data set to permit meaningful plausibility assessments of all the models in, in that set. So now, having adopted the calibration principle, though, we can now talk about an underlying data generating model, M sub dg. And you can regard that as unknown to you, and then try to do modeling in a way that will produce a model ensemble that gets you close to that data generating model. So not being able to compute the thing we want, which is in effect conditioning on all possible models, which is like not conditioning on any models at all, generally anyway, you're not able to compute that. So in practice, the best you can do is to compute something like that expression I wrote here at the top of page 31. It's the posterior for theta given the data set and an ensemble of models, script M, and the background information where M, script M is an ensemble of models, a collection of them, a set of them, finite or countably or uncountably infinite. And you try to choose that set well. And we haven't said yet what well means. Um, one thing it, uh, it means is that uh, we should try to do so in a way that produces well-calibrated predictions based upon that ensemble of models. And there are going to be some other principles that we'll be getting to later today and next Friday. So evidently, what you want, among other things, 
is for ScriptM to contain one or more models that are at least that are identical or at least close to the actual data generating model. And so um, people have developed some math for what happens with Bayesian modeling as a function of the truth compared with what you're prepared to consider as possible. So if this is your model ensemble ScriptM and the true data generating model is in here, then what would you like to happen to the posterior distribution on all the different models as you got more and more data? By the fact that you said these were the only models that you cared about, the prior distribution on model space is restricted only to that blob, and all the other models outside there have prior probability zero, so they're always going to have posterior probability zero. But what would you like to have happen inside that blob? Wouldn't it be nice if the posterior distribution on what the right model is would start to, to, to accumulate more and more right on the truth. So my mental image is I, I'm thinking of something like a normal curve coming right out of the picture, and I want that, essentially I want the overall process to converge to the right data generating um, point. Does that make some sense? And there's a theorem that says this is actually what happens. As n goes to infinity, um, the posterior on models, given the data, and the background information converges to point mass on the actual data generating model if the actual data generating model is inside your ensemble. So the right thing does happen from the Bayesian point of view if you make your ensemble big enough. With enough data, the data will help you figure out what the right model is. But what if this is your model ensemble? and the actual data generating model is out here, then the posterior distribution cannot move toward point mass on the truth because you already gave the truth prior probability zero. So what would you hope would happen then? Yes, you have a distance metric, and I'll tell you about it later. It's called callback leibler divergence. And so if you have a distance measure, what would you hope is true? You drop a perpendicular from this to that set, and what you hope is that if you can't get there, you can all the probability will at least concentrate on the place right there that's inside your space that's as close as possible, according to that distance measure. And that turns out to be a theorem also. If, if M D G is not in script M, then the posterior on models given the data and the background converges to point mass on the nearest, in quotes, model class. It might be a parametric class inside script M. And nearest turns out to be in relation to this thing called callback leibler callback leibler divergence. And I'll tell you about callback leibler later. Leibler divergence. Okay, so that's sort of good news. Um, of course, I should come back to this picture one more time. It's definitely good news if your model class is big enough, because then with more and more data, you find the right structure. And it's sort of good news if your model class does not include the data generating model, because you come as close to it as you can. But of course, this theorem that guarantees this second picture down here does not say anything about how far that, that little distance is right there. And if the data generating model is quite far from the space that you're working with, all you can guarantee is that you found the closest place, which might not be very close at all. So that's all the theorem can tell us. Now, suppose initially, for the sake of discussion, that you've identified an ensemble of this kind. And I'm going to give some ideas for how to build such an ensemble later. And suppose it turns out to be finite. So script M contains k models in it, for k being some number greater than or equal to 2. And now we have a question, and it's the same one I asked you before. Namely, am I supposed to try to choose one of these models and throw the others away, which is called the model selection problem? Or am I supposed to combine them in some way? Or what am I supposed to do? And 
now I want to remind you here on this page uh, about the S star approach. Um, so this is redundant with what I showed you in Colin's dissertation, but people used to solve this problem by ignoring it. And so you've seen already um, this part of using the data to conduct a search, setting up, settling on a single apparently best model, M star, and then draw inferences about theta pretending that M star is, is equal to M dg. And as we've agreed repeatedly today and perhaps even earlier, this can lead to bad calibration, and it's almost always in the direction of pretending that you know more than you actually do, and that will generally result in your intervals being not as wide as they should be. So your, let's say your nominal 90% posterior predictive intervals for data not used in the modeling process would include the truth um, quite a bit less than 90% of the time. So the M star approach, quote, solves the problem of how to specify the ensemble by setting the ensemble equal to just that, that model M star. And for the sake of the narrative I want to unfold for you now, I'll continue to postpone for the moment how you might do a better job of arriving at that ensemble. I'm still going to say, suppose you've got that ensemble in some way. How can you assess your uncertainty across the models in uh, script M and appropriately propagate or pass this uncertainty through to your uncertainty about the thing you care about and do that in a well-calibrated way? And after decades of research on this, um, the Bayesian profession seems to have come up with three ways to try to make progress on this. One of them is called Bayesian, they all have uh, three letter acronyms. One of them is called Bayesian Model Averaging, BMA. One of them is called Bayesian Nonparametrics, BNP. And the other one is that calibration cross-validation idea that I shared with you earlier. Nothing. It's just a name for a collection of models. We can call it an ensemble, but we, we could also call it a set. All right. So. Um, um, the equation that forms the basis of Bayesian model averaging, and this is what I wrote about in my 1995 paper, is sort of easy to describe. I need to switch, thank you. You, you pick some quantity that has the same meaning across all the models that you're thinking of using. So you've got an ensemble of models, m1 dot 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 out to mk. And so we need to pick a quantity that is common, has the same meaning across all the models. And a, an important quantity that, share, that has that property is the value of future data from the process that generated this particular data set. So I'm going to call y star a future data value. And I want to make a predictive distribution for Y star, given the data I've seen so far, and given the background information, and conditioning on this particular ensemble. So I haven't said which of those models is right. I've just said I'm going to restrict attention just to that ensemble. Well, um, what should we do? If I knew which model was the right one, then I would actually know quite a bit about what to do because I could write down something like this. I could write down um, the probability of Y star given the data and the background and model three, let's say. That is OK to work with. But somehow I have to get from the thing I, I want to that thing right there. And so the way people do it is the same way we have talked about all course long. I want to get something on the right-hand side of the conditioning bar that's not in the conversation yet. So I begin by introducing it to the conversation. So let's go and stick it in. And you always have to stick it in by the law of total probability. You have to introduce it in the conversation on the left-hand side of the conditioning bar. So here I'm going to call MJ, uh, given the data and the background information and the fact that the model has to come from that ensemble. And so isn't it going to be true that if I add that up across all the models, that will be um, a correct equality, because I've just used the law of total probability, right? The predictive distribution given the ensemble has to be the predictive distribution uh, for, um, it has to be this particular quantity, y star and mj, given that stuff, added up across all the mjs. But now look, j equals 1 to k. Now I do that usual dodge. It's on the wrong side of the conditioning bar, so let's move it over there and see what happens if I do. D, B, M and MJ. And now, of course, if I know it's MJ, then I don't have to pay attention to script M anymore, because I know it's M MJ. 
And the right thing you have to multiply is the um, posterior probability for MJ given the data and the background and the fact that you're working with model, model ensemble M. So look what that says to do. Your overall predictive distribution for a future data value is computable as a weighted average of your conditional predictive distribution given model MJ weighted by the posterior model probabilities that MJ is the right one. So from the Bayesian point of view, you can talk about what's the probability that model 6 is the right model, is the data generating model. You can't talk about that from the frequentist point of view. But from the Bayesian point of view, it makes perfect good sense, perfectly good sense. And this is what you should do. If there were an infinite set of models here, this sort of expression would be the same, except the sum would be replaced by an integral, and we'd be, we'd be uh, collecting, we'd be adding up in the integral across all the different models that were there. And so back on this screen here, the equation I'm showing you, um, this was first proposed by an economist named Ed Lemer, and then I was the first person after him to explore the consequences of this um, in a uh, quite public forum. Uh, it was a uh, red paper before the Royal Statistical Society with, with uh, discussion and rejoinder. And so basically, I'm using the notation here I see in equation 5, d star. So the future data d star, given the present data and the model ensemble M and the background information, it's a weighted average of the conditional predictive distributions given individual models M, weighted by the posterior model probabilities. So like it says there, that just makes a lot of sense. I hope you'd agree with me. Equation 5 tells you to form a weighted average of your conditional predictive distributions given particular models weighted by those models' posterior probabilities. And this approach often provides substantially better calibration than the M star method, which would just put all your eggs in, in one basket. And I can give a little illustration of what's going on that has a forecasting character to it over here on the document camera. So suppose you're trying to forecast something like the, the price of oil. So this is time going this way, and this is oil price going this way. So I don't know, the, the spot price of, of Brent crude um, in New York on the morning of the day in question. And it looks like that. And then there's this moment called now, <laughs> and you don't know what's happening after that. Um, well, you might be able to develop a variety of models based upon different economic assumptions. And one of the models might have a forecast line that went out like this. And one might have one that went out like that. And one might have one that went out like that. And one might have one that went out like that. And each of them by themselves, or any particular point in the future, would have a predictive distribution that is centered on that trend line but having some uncertainty around it. So those represent, those things there are the conditional predictive distributions given the separate models. And what Bayesian model averaging says to do is at that moment in time, that time right there, T, what you want to do to get a composite measure is the obvious thing. Take a weighted average across all those things with weights proportional to how plausible each of those models is based on the data that you've seen so far. So you might end up with weight 0.4 on this one, and 0.3 on this one, and 0.1 on this one, and 0.2 on that one, for example. And the composite distribution is going to look like what? It's going to look like a rather broad distribution because it encompasses the possibility that these extreme possibilities are really there that need to be, need to be looked at. And so the overall or composite distribution, which I haven't drawn very well, but you can imagine sort of a, a big wide normal curve there, will end up being a weighted average of each of the separate normal curves weighted by the model plausibilities. And it will tend to be wider than any single model, and that will allow you to appropriately hedge against the uncertainty that you have. In fact, I did exactly that in one of the examples in the uh, 1995 paper on model uncertainty. So let's take a look at that paper. Ah, good question. Not easily, turns out. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, that task is, is um, harder than most of the things we've talked about so far. Um, but I, I can tell you how, and um, we can go from there. So 
I talk about structural uncertainty, and I talk about overfitting as an issue to pay attention to. Um, I show an example in which this is a wonderful example to show how much overfitting people often do when they use the S star approach. Uh, a guy I used to work with at Rand called John Adams um, published as his PhD dissertation the most comprehensive investigation as of 1995, and I bet it's still the most comprehensive here in 2013, the most comprehensive investigation to date of the effects of the search for S star on inference in regression. He, you know what we do as analysts in regression models, we fiddle around with a whole bunch of things. What's, what subset of the predictor should you use? How should you transform the outcome variable, transform the predictor variable? How should you delete outliers that don't look um, right to you? And so on. So he estimated the combined effects of all that stuff on the nominal observed significance level of the usual R squared measure, which is a measure of how well the regression is doing. R squared is a measure of the proportion of the variation in the outcome variable Y that, that is associated with the prediction Y hat. He varied the sample size from 10 to 70, the number of predictors X from 5 to 30, and the degree of correlation among the predictors from 0 to 0.75. And he simulated random error and predictor values from T distributions with degrees of freedom ranging from 1 to infinity, so the Cauchy all the way up to the normal. And he examined 114 different regression strategies, each based on a different pattern of presence or absence of the following things that people do all the time in the Bailing regression models. They use a, some kind of outlier rejection rule. He used the Bonferroni one. They select variables using a stepwise algorithm or, um, or something like Mallow's CP. They transform the X values with the Box Tidwell approach, and they transform the Y with the Box Cox approach. Averaging over characteristics of the data sets, he created a whole bunch of null data sets in which Y was totally unrelated to X. And so the p-values for judging the significance of the observed r-squared should have, should have averaged out to 0.5 and, in fact, should have had a uniform distribution from 0 to 1 if um, there was nothing going on in terms of model selection. He found that the most opportunistic of the 114 strategies produced average nominal p-values well below 0 0.001. In other words, violently significant even when there was nothing going on in the data. Just because you had tried out so many different things, you tortured the data so much that there was some version of, of the modeling process that looked like it really found strong signal in the data, even though no signal was present. And that every strategy involving either stepwise or CP-based selection of variables yielded average nominal values below 0.01. In other words, anytime you allow people to do variable selection and not pay the price for variable selection, you were again finding massive apparent signal when no signal was present. And I just made a remark in the paper, the degree of similarity between some of the most egregious strategies in Adam's experiment and standard textbook prescriptions for empirical regression model building is disquieting. <laughs> in fact, if you look at a book like Weisberg's book on regression or other people, they're telling you to do all this stuff. Basically, what John Adams did was he, he got out a book like Weisberg and looked at all the things that they said you should do, and he fired all of them up and built a little expert system that tried all of them at once. And, uh, uh, he gave it all data sets where nothing was going on, and, and of course his machinery found tremendous signal when it wasn't really there. So the, 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 the lack of acknowledgement of model uncertainty leads to many, 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 many false positives. That's the point. Your intervals are far narrower than they should be. You end up thinking that stuff is real when it's not, so that's the point. One of my two case studies involved this very thing I just drew a picture of for you, forecasting the price of oil. Um, there was a big collection of experts at Stanford many years ago that, that um, assembled a 43-person working group of economists and energy experts. I regard that as a frightening prospect also. Uh, 5,000 statisticians is one thing, but 43 economists in the same room, uh, uh, whose goal was to forecast world oil prices from 1981 all the way out to the year 20, 2020, aid in policy planning. Do you think that a forecast from 19, of the oil price from 1981 out to the year 2020 is worth much? Um, unbelievable, uh, but that's part of, of the, the, the story of being an economist, I guess. Um, this group generated predictions based on each of 10 leading econometric models under each of 12 different scenarios, embodying a variety of assumptions about inputs to the models, like things like supply and demand and growth rates of relevant quantities. One scenario was chosen as the so-called reference. It was identified as a plausible median case and as, quote, representative of the general trends that might be expected. Readers of the group summary report were cautioned not to interpret point predictions based on the reference scenario as the working group's forecast, because there are too many unknowns to accept any projection as a forecast. But then they went ahead and, and uh, 
uh, and, and gave you the results without proper uncertainty bands around them, encouraging everybody to do what they, they said you shouldn't do anyway, right? The summary report concluded, however, that most of the uncertainty about future oil prices concerns not whether these prices will rise, but how rapidly they will rise. And actually, we know, of course, in, in, uh, in retrospect, that in the, in the medium term on their scenario story, on their forecasting story, they were right. But one may identify three sources of uncertainty here. Scenario uncertainty about the inputs to the models, model uncertainty conditional on the scenario about how to translate those inputs into forecasts, and then predictive uncertainty conditional on the scenario and the model. The working group did not attempt to assess predictive uncertainty at all, and their final report concentrated on the reference scenario, which despite their warning, tended to downplay scenario uncertainty as well. But model uncertainty conditional on the reference scenario was evident in their, in their reports, tables, and figures. So here's figure one. It's a plot of the yearly point predictions from each of the 10 econometric models under the reference scenario from 1980 to 1990. And so you can see um, we're back in a time that, that um, uh, some of us in the room may dimly remember when the price of oil was about 30 bucks a barrel back in 1980. And most of the models were forecasting a modest rise from about $35 a barrel up to something around $45 a barrel over that 10-year period. But look, there was one scenario that suggested that oil prices were going to drop, and actually rather dramatically over that period, uh, and then start to rise again. Averaging across models, giving them equal weight, since the EMF summary report treats them even-handedly, to obtain a predicted value for a year like 1986, would yield a figure of about $39, with implied 90% uncertainty bands across the models, conditional on the reference scenario, but ignoring predictive uncertainty, a band of about a uh, range from 27 to 51 dollars. And this uncertainty band was consistent with those produced by other efforts parallel to this groups at the time. Uh, the, um, uh, another um, analyst said, many reputable institutions and individuals made forecasts in 1986 oil prices in the 70s and early 80s, predicting prices over 40 bucks. And she reports that 500 billion dollars was invested worldwide by governments and private companies in the early 80s on the strength of forecasts that oil prices would rise. And as Jeffrey seems to be looking up on his phone right now, uh, I will now tell, give you the punchline. The actual 1986 world average spot price was $13. So there was a scenario that almost perfectly got it right. And yet that scenario was given no weight at all in their uh, report because they only gave weight to the reference scenario. So what we really ought to be doing here is averaging over all the scenarios averaging over all the models conditioned on the scenarios, and averaging over all the predictive uncertainty, and we would end up with quite a wide uncertainty band indeed. And so one of the things I did in this uh, paper was to show what the right analysis should have shown. And what we end up with, I'll just skip to that, actually, and show you what the... the final predictive distribution based on all the uncertainty that I, that I could find from what they have produced the following. Um, these are the um, mean forecasts across the 12 scenarios with standard deviations from what they have and uh, uh, prior probabilities that were based upon uh, subjective judgment of the experts themselves. And when I'm done, I end up with a predictive distribution. The one they got is the one in dotted lines, um, and the one I got is the one in solid lines. And in fact, $13 is still fairly unlikely based upon um, the story, but it's, it's hundreds of times, thousands of times more likely than what you get by using their other thing, because the, way, the height of their curve is essentially zero, and the height of my curve is at least about 0 .05, 0 .005. So, so anyway, um, I'm not claiming that this did a picture-perfect job of getting the right answer, but it did a much better job by correctly propagating uncertainty across the things that you were really uncertain about. The paper also analyzes the um, uh, Challenger space shuttle disaster. Um, this was the data set on which the um, engineers at NASA tried to base their judgment of whether to launch the Challenger on the night before um, the um, actual disaster. Uh, each X represents um, a sh previous shuttle flight, and the horizontal variable is the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit at which the, the, the um, shuttle was launched um, at the time the shuttle was launched in, on the launch pad, and the vertical scale is uh, the number of those 
joints that connect the different parts of the rocket that had to get you up into, into out through the atmosphere with erosion of the O-rings. You probably, we all, everybody in the room probably remembers that phrase O-ring, right? So there's these enormous rubbery kind of things that had to twist when the, when the rocket was torquing as it was spinning, heading up and so on. So there were six different um, uh, O-rings, uh, rather field joints, and each one could, could or could not experience a primary erosion of the O-ring. And uh, the, the, the story here is that um, if you look in the right-hand part of the picture, when the temperature was above about 65 degrees, almost nothing ever failed. In fact, all of those are zeros. Some of them just occurred more than one time at that particular temperature, except for one failure at, uh, well, I guess, two failures at 70 degrees. Um, but then there's an ominous pattern in which the colder things get, the more failures are occurring. And the engineers had to decide there was the temperature at a predicted temperature at launch on the night before launch, 31 or 32 degrees, 31 degrees Fahrenheit. And so the question is, on the basis of this data set, would you launch or not? Um, and in fact, um, these guys, um, uh, let me get their names again. Uh, Sid Dalal and his colleagues uh, at Bell Labs did uh, an extensive risk analysis after the fact to uh, see what was going on. And they built a bunch of different so-called generalized linear models to try to pass through those data points. Uh, things like logistic regression and uh, probit regression and complementary log-log regression and all this stuff. Um, uh, I won't go into it too much here. But they had six different model structures they were prepared to consider. And um, in fact, they just um, used one particular one. They, they tried all six and they found that the, um, what the logit T model, I'm calling it, was the best one. So they, they threw away all the others. And so I was just showing what happens if you don't throw away all the others. And um, basically, um, there's some technical details you have to work out. But these are the conditional posterior distributions for the chance of bad things happening for the six structural choices. Um, one of the structural choices they were working with, the so-called no effect model, um, uh, predicted not, not, hardly anything bad happening. You know, the probability of something bad happening was very small. And all the other distributions had a lot of mass up near, up near really high values. And so. Um, I will tell you, by the way, that um, an argument that was made by the, the, not the engineers, but by the managers about this picture here is the following. Um, if you look at the data there and you try to build a curve for yourself that starts at around 50 some degrees Fahrenheit and goes through about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, you discover the, the disquieting fact that the chance of something bad happening goes down for a while as it gets warmer and then starts to go up again, according to the, the manager who was in the room. Because you see those that point right there, if I can highlight it, that point right there. And so this manager said, actually, that's telling me that this relationship is bowl-shaped. It's actually U-shaped, like a bowl-shaped up parabola. That doesn't make any, any physical sense to me as, a, as someone who knows some physics. So I think this whole picture is rubbish. We should throw it out and just decide based upon other considerations. So that's a, really bad, <laughs> that's a really bad argument. Someone else in the room said, if what we're interested in is whether things fail, then all the times on which there were no failures are irrelevant. And so we should throw away all the zeros and just look at the rest. And there doesn't seem to be anything much happening. It's just a kind of a trend, almost a linear trend, almost a horizontal trend. Can you imagine that argument? If you're trying to predict whether things fail or not, all the occasions on which no failures occurred are irrelevant. That was one of the arguments that's in the tape, because they taped all these conversations um, uh, afterwards. So you can see there was some bad analysis going on, at least proposed by the non-engineers. The engineers were terrified. This picture here, the engineers were terrified by this data. And they, they urged not, no launch to occur. And it appears that the final launch decision was made in the White House and not um, by NASA at all. Uh, it appears that they were um, that they were overruled and told that they should launch because you remember the circumstances. There was it was the first time was it a teacher that poor woman a teacher was going to be sent up into space and Reagan had done all this stuff about oh isn't it great that we can send teachers into space and they had already had to postpone the launch three or four times to get to this point and the White House just thought it was bad politics to to hold off the launch anymore. There you go. Um, you know for sure they weren't. Because, because 
Yes. Um, uh, Richard Feynman, who was on the commission uh, afterwards, said that they did have this picture in front of them. In front of them, and so uh, I, I like Feynman. I, I trust him. So. Um, anyway, when you propagate uncertainty properly, what you find is that far from the the structure they're interested in having all, all the posterior probability, in fact, um, those different structures. Let's see. Let me find you the table that has the posterior model probabilities in it. First of all, there were six quite different implications for what would happen at, at 30, 31 degrees, according to all six of these models. You'll notice they all go through the data about the same, but then they dramatically widen out in what they're going to do uh, with far extrapolation. Of course, any statistician look at this picture would say, let's look back at it again, would say, good luck, right? Good luck to you to extrapolate, what is this, 53 degrees, to extrapolate 22 degrees out into the left out into left field when no data has ever been anywhere near that cold. Good luck to you, right? Um, uh, but if you were forced to do it, you would want to try to be, uh, to hedge against uncertainty as much as is reasonable because there are people's lives at stake and a lot of money and setting the, setting the space shuttle program back and blah, blah. Um, the posterior model probabilities came out. Where is that table? Maybe I already just passed it. I guess that table does have the things in it that I want. Yes. Here are the posterior model probabilities over here in the, right, in the right hand column. They're called structure i, the posterior probability of structure i given the data. And it's true that their logit t model did have fairly high posterior probability, but look, there were a bunch of other models that had quite plausible, plausible posterior probabilities. And the model averaging should be done across all the ones, all six of them. Of course, the one called no effect is only going to get weight 0.005 in the, in the averaging, so it's going to be ignored, as it should be. Um, but the other ones all, all deserve a um, a, uh, a crack at the data, and uh, what I ended up being able to show was that putting it all on that one model um, uh, claims that um, um, you have far more implied data at 31 degrees Fahrenheit than you really do. I think that the, the law, Sid the Laws people said, that the, that data set was equivalent to having about six or seven observations at 31 degrees. And the model uncertainty analysis showed instead that the result is equivalent to only one binary observation at 31 degrees. And so you, you really aren't, you don't know what's much of what's going on there at all. And any attempt to hedge against uncertainty would, would, um, would tell you that you shouldn't launch based upon this extra uncertainty that arises from the model story. Well, how do we get these model probabilities you were asking about? You are right that that's part of the deal that we have to worry about. Let's have a look. So the first model averaging equation um, is just the one that I've shown you already. Um, conditioning only on a particular model class, you have to take a weighted average of, of, the, of the inferential or predictive distributions given each model and then weight them by the model probabilities. And if there's uncertainty both in terms of structure and also in terms of parameters conditional on structure, then you have to do a double integral, both of over structure and also parameters conditional on structure. And a lot of people have thought about this. The posterior model probabilities um, can be written in this fashion here. Um, you work out the prior probability for a particular structure, I'm sorry, the posterior probability for a particular structure times the the posterior plausibility for the parameters given that particular structure. And then um, we have to calculate each of those things, working backward from this expression from Bayes' theorem to work out um, the posterior model probability for a given model M. You have to work out these those two things there. Work those back out to the prior distributions on which the posterior model probabilities are based gives this expression here. So you have to be able to put a prior on structures. And so that's already kind of hard. It's like saying that all six of those models that Sid and Lal were interested in, we might put them all as equally likely in the prior. I don't have any other information otherwise. Then I have to put a prior on the parameters given the structure. Then I have to put a sampling distribution on the data given the parameters in the structure. And unfortunately, in this Bayesian model averaging stuff, this term right here in the middle, the one I'm trying to kind of circle with this little guy right here, that the answer turns out to be quite sensitive to the way that those priors are specified. And so a difficulty of Bayesian model averaging is how to do that in a way that, that you don't shoot yourself in the foot. And so I showed people a, um, a simple way to avoid having to specify those priors. 
um, that was based on Laplace approximations, one of the two ways that we can approximate the integrals involved uh, in, um, in Bayesian work. And so you can read about Laplace approximations in here a little bit. There's a few other ideas. Then I'm talking about the finite set of structural alternatives. And equation six is just like what I had a minute ago. You take the weighted posterior probabilities of the um, uh, individual structures, and you use those as weights against the predictive distributions given individual structures. But then you have to bring in the parameters, so there's an integral you have to approximate as well, where you integrate over the parameters in each model. And that's a pain. Um, and so um, I give some advice on how to um, specify the prior on structure space, essentially to figure out which which models should be included in the uh, set of models you're entertaining. And if you recall this picture back here that shows what happens when you get a lot of data, this ensemble M here, in order to have a decent chance of the truth being inside it, do we want that ensemble to be big or small or in between? Um, that's an interesting observation. You want it to be, uh, you want it to have the truth in it, but um, you would like it to be relatively small around the truth because then your uncertainty bands are not going to be any wider than they need to be based upon model uncertainty. That's exactly true. But since the true data generating model is just this tiny little needle in a haystack, basically to have the data inform um, what the right story is, if you compare that picture with this one, do you want big models, or big model spaces or small ones? You want big, right? Because you want a better chance of the, your model ensemble, including the, the actual data generating possibility. And so the way that played out in, in Jimmy Savage's mind um, is he said that everybody's model should be as big as a house. In fact, I talked with Dennis Lindley about it once, and he said, actually, he thought uh, Savage had said everybody's model should be as big as an elephant. But it's the same basic idea. You want your model space to be big. and um, Essentially, you want your alternative structures you're putting in there to satisfy two main criteria. First of all, the other structures we're keeping in there should have high posterior probability if they weren't given zero prior probability by you forgetting to include them. And also, they should have inferential or predictive consequences that differ substantially from those in the S-star approach. And um, in a paper I wrote earlier with some other people, we referred to that process in, in part two of this as staking out the corners in model space. And so that idea, we can use that idea to suggest different directions of departure um, that are most relevant for model expansion. So then there's some stuff about computing. You have to compute the conditional inferential or predictive distributions. And I make a simple approximation by sticking in the maximum likelihood estimator. And in computing the posterior stru uh, structural probabilities, I use this thing um, uh, called the Laplace approximation in equation 10. Uh, and basically, it turns out that the prior uh, probabilities don't even enter into this approximation. So um, we don't have to actually specify them. So that's, um, that's um, lucky. Um, then um, I build this large sample approximation. This is sort of a back of the envelope approximation for Bayesian model averaging. The thing you want is that equation at the top right there under 5.4. And what you do is you get the MLE and the um, maximum log likelihood value for each model. And you set k sub i to be the dimension of the parameter vector in model i. And then we do the following approximations. And um, out comes the numbers you need to do the Bayesian model averaging. And so then the rest of the paper is examples. And I have brought with me another example to show you today. Um, if you go to, to uh, CRAN, and type in under search, type in something like Bayesian model averaging, for instance, you'll find that there's actually quite a lot of stuff out there, already packages. And I'm going to show you how to use this package BMS today. Uh, an even broader package um, is available called BMA uh, for Bayesian model averaging. Um, and uh, that was developed by um, a guy called Adrian Raftery, who also did early work on, on model uncertainty. Uh, I think for next time, I'll, I'll create a uh, an parallel analysis with BMA of the data set I'm about to show you here and see how different they are. And there's probably a bunch of other packages also. You can look around. There's something called dynamic model averaging. And here's, a, um, there's, that, there's, here's one called Bayesian adaptive sampling as a way of doing Bayesian model averaging. There's, there's a lot of different possibilities. But I'm going to show you the, the, the BMS approach. 
So one of the things I put on the course webpage was um, this, the guy who created the uh, BMS package is a Scandinavian guy. And, um, oh no, he's, he's a Swiss, I think. That's, um, he, um, uh, Stefan Zeugner, and he, for once, inside CRAN, I was talking with somebody at lunch, the CRAN routines often don't have very good documentation in the sense that they tell you how to use the function, but they don't always give you tutorial examples to show you how to use the functions. But this guy actually wrote a, a what is this, a, a 20 or 30 page paper in which he actually shows you how to use his functions. So this is really good. And so I've put this on the web page for you, and I've created some, some R code to, to walk you through it. So let's begin. So I have some data down here in the bottom part of the world. Um, so here's some R code to do Bayesian model averaging in a multiple linear regression example. So let me go ahead and show you. There's a data set that's, um, there's a whole bunch of canned data sets inside R, and one of them is called the attitude data set. And so you get at it inside R by just saying data, open parenthesis, attitude, close parenthesis. Uh, and then you say help. And so let's get into R. In fact, I'm going to start over again with a fresh copy. And grab the data. It's already part of every R installation. There's a whole bunch of data sets like that. And if you look at it, it gives you a, a web page, and it says, OK, from a survey of the clerical employees of a large financial organization, the data have been aggregated from the questionnaires of about 35 employees chosen at random from each of 30 randomly selected departments. So they have different departments inside the organization, and they chose 35 people at random inside each department. Each department was selected randomly. So they actually did a cluster sample. And then for each, uh, instead of giving us the data down at the level of employee, which is what they should have done, they should have given us the two-stage data, they averaged across all the people inside each department. So the numbers we have are the percent proportion of favorable responses to seven questions in each department. And we can tell from the way the word favorable is spelled that this data set is from Britain rather than from America. Um, so we end up with 30 observations, one for each department inside this so-called large financial organization. And we have seven variables. One of them, the outcome variable Y that we're trying to predict is the overall rating. And the other six variables are different measures of, of uh, summary measures of questions that were asked that, that was thought had something to do with the overall rating. So each person. Each of the employees was asked to give an overall rating uh, of uh, what it was like to work at this place. And then um, the interest is in trying to see how well we can predict the overall rating from the different subcomponents of things that are supposed to go into it. So how well does the employer handle employee complaints? Does the, the uh, organization allow special privileges? Is there a lot of opportunity to learn on the job? Do you get raises based on your performance? Are your bosses too critical of your work? And are there enough opportunities for advancement? So these seem like all things that would be good to know. Um, and having got the data in there, I can now just simply type attitude. And we'll get the data set. And there it is. These numbers have all been routed to the nearest percentage point. So we have 30 rows, one for each department in the company. And there's our seven variables, where the Y or outcome variable is on the left. And the other six are right there as you see them. Let me go back to the course web page. Um, now, nobody can look at a table of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 times 30, 210 numbers and see much, right? It's hard to, to look at it. So let's start visualizing it. And so um, the tutorial on the attitude uh, that's built right into that web page that talks about the attitude story, they give some code down here that suggests how to analyze the data. And it's, it includes some pretty good suggestions. Um, let's bring in the package's stats and graphics, which are part of the uh, hidden behind the curtain story in R, and then run the pairs command and see what it does. Ah. What does this look like to you guys? Well, I mean, what's the basic structure of this picture, this plot? It's a matrix, 
right? And it's a square matrix, and it has two, four, six, seven rows and seven columns, one for each variable. And so what do you suppose is happening in this cell right here that I'm pointing the arrow to? It's a scatter plot, right? It's a scatter plot of the variable called rating on the vertical scale against what on the horizontal? You look at the variable right below it, the name right below it, complaint. And so they've made what's called a scatter plot matrix. It's all possible pairwise scatter plots of all the variables taken two at a time. And the ones below the diagonal are related to the ones above the diagonal in kind of a trivial way, right? Because if you interchange the row of x and y in a scatter plot, you have essentially the same information. So you don't have to look at the whole matrix. You only have to look either at the upper diagonal or the lower, I mean the upper triangle or the lower triangle. Um, do these look like samples from bivariate normal distributions? Which would be nice because the basic assumptions of linear regression are most readily satisfied when the outcome and all the predictor variables are approximately Gaussian. Do they look like approximately like draws from, from um, bivariate normal distributions? Quite a few of them do, actually, if you look at them a bit. Um, and in fact, I don't see a whole lot of evidence of massive outliers. I don't see a whole lot of evidence of strong nonlinearity. It just looks like a pretty vanilla case where we ought to be able to fit each of these things as a linear predictor without messing with it and um, have the outcome variable be approximately normal as well. Of course, there's a good reason for that because each of these things was the average of 35 numbers across the employees in each of these departments. And so every single variable has a central limiting tendency acting upon it and creating that average. So no wonder these things look sort of like, like normal. The marginal distributions are normal and the, and the bivariate story is normal. No wonder. Um, okay, um, so now what else would be good to do? Well, you can run the summary command on any data frame and it will produce the results you see right here. Oops, there we go. Um, and so what it gives is for each variable, it gives you um, the mean and the median and a whole bunch of, and the, the quartiles and the min and the max. Um, and the main thing I get from this table is to compare the mean and the median and see how close they are to each other. And that's a rough measure of symmetry of the distribution. And so if you look, all six variables seem to be not far from symmetric because their medians and their means are pretty close to each other. All right, what else? Why not get the correlation matrix? You get that with COR. And so there's the correlation matrix. In fact, I'll look at it in blue. Um, again, this is another matrix where uh, there's a lot of triviality going on. It, the correlation of a variable like rating with itself has to be plus one, right? So the diagonal entries are boring. They're just all plus ones. And the off-diagonal entries are symmetric around the, the, the matrix is symmetric because if you interchange the role of x and y, the correlation coefficient stays the same. So in particular, I draw your attention to the column called rating. And we now correlate rating with all the predictor variables because that's quite interesting. It says marginally, not accounting for other effects of the variables, marginally, which are the variables that look like they're going to have the best predictive power? And they would be the ones with the biggest pairwise correlations with the outcome, right? And so looks like complaints is going to help us, followed by learning, maybe followed by raises, followed maybe by privileges, and critical and advanced don't seem to have a lot to do with it on a marginal basis. Then in the rest of the, the matrix, what we should be looking for is large values that are not involved, involving correlations between the rating variable and the predictors, but the, between the predictors and each other predictors. Because large values in that, that area indicates what's the term? Co problems with collinearity, where some of the x's of pairwise are highly correlated with each other. Um, also, um, possibly there might be other kinds of, of collinearity, but the simplest kind is just that the two, the two or more of the x's pairwise, in a pairwise fashion, there's some pairs that are strongly correlated with each other. Do you guys see any collinearity problems, those of you who know how to look at this matrix and look for collinearity problems? Which one do you see? Is this one here, is that the one you're thinking of? Is that the biggest one we see? Or are there even bigger ones? No, but the point 82 is the correlation with the outcome that we want. So we're only going to look at all the, all the predictor variables with each other. I think this is the biggest one, isn't it? That, believe it or not, means no problem with collinearity at all. 
um, we would need to worry about numbers that were well over plus 0.9 to be worried about collinearity. And so um, this actually looks like a very vanilla data set where hardly anything bad could happen. Um, and in fact, nothing bad does happen. So, so let's go. Um, I made a bunch of normal QQ plots of each variable one by one just to get a sense of what's going on with that as well. And so, um, so you can look at each variable. That's the, the outcome variable. And it, it looks Gaussian. In fact, you can look at all the other ones as well. I'll just run them all by real fast and um, see if you can catch the movie. Well, oh, there it went. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, they all look pretty much, you know, it looks sort of like um, uh, random draws from Gaussian. So everywhere you look, this data set is, is pure vanilla. Now, a standard uh, maximum likelihood analysis would just say, all right, I'm just going to regress the outcome variable on all those guys and see what happens. And so you do that in R with the linear models command, LM for short. And so here's what you get. Um, basically, we fit a model in which simply um, the rating variable has been predicted by each of the other variables entered in linearly. There are no interaction terms in this model, for those of you who know about that, where we would start multiplying the predictor variables together. There also are no attempts to enter any of the variables in quadratically or cubically, but we saw from those scatter plots that we probably don't need to do that. Um, but there aren't any interactions. We have not explored interactions yet. We're looking only at what people call main effects. So does it look like any of the predictor variables are useful for predicting rating? Those of you who know how to interpret this table. Yeah, complaints looks pretty good from a frequentist point of view. It's signal to noise ratio. T value is about 3.8. And uh, if, for people who like to look at p values, that corresponds to a two-tailed p value of under 0.001. So that's a pretty strong signal. And the other ones don't really look all that exciting, do they? Maybe learning is a signal to noise ratio of nearly two, um, but it doesn't look like there's that much going on. Um, again, those of you who know how to look at these tables, are we doing a pretty good job of predicting the rating variable from all the predictors here? Overall, what do you look at? Yeah, the R squared or the adjusted R squared. The R squared is about 73%. The adjusted R squared, about 66%. That's a middling good value, right? It's not a great value. We don't really, uh, we, we don't have a really good idea what's going on here, but we, we have some idea what's going on. All right. Now, that's the, the, the um, maximum likelihood approach. And a pretty standard thing that frequentists would do at this point is just start tossing out the variables that don't look like they matter, right? And eventually, you'll probably get down to a variable, a, a model that includes only the complaint variable, for instance. So let's fit that model and see um, how it does. Actually, I think I'm going to show you a few more uh, things. Um, I'm going to plot um, the results of that and look at some residual plots. And so um, this is standard stuff that comes out of the LM command, the linear models command, a really standard plot that statisticians always look at is a plot of the residuals against the fitted values up in the upper left-hand corner. And then the uh, red line is what's called a robust smoother of the relationship between the residuals and the fitted values. And if everything is OK, it's supposed to look like the horizontal line 0. And you can see it sort of does look like that. The, the red little line, non-parametric fitting line, looks a lot like the line 0. Then to the right, we have a normal QQ plot of the uh, residuals. And you can see they look a fairly uh, fair amount like, um, like the draws from a normal curve. Uh, interestingly, the um, uh, code has picked out for us and labeled the observations that are the most discrepant. So observations 6 and 23 and 12 look a little bit unusual relative to everything else. Then the bottom left-hand plot is a plot of the square root of the standardized residuals against the fitted values. And the basic idea there is to look for what's called heteroscedasticity. Basically, you want this plot to be roughly constant as you read from left to right, because that means that the residuals about all have the same value, no matter what the fitted values are. And it, it's got what appears to be a little bit of structure in it of a kind of a um, down, then up sort of character to it. But I wouldn't put much into that. Um, in fact, um, you, you, to really know what's going on with that, you'd have to, again, do another simulation study where you created 30 points at random from, from uh, normal distributions with no relationship at all and plotted those little cur smooth red curves on there over and over again and look to see how often you would see something interesting like this. And 
the answer is, I'm afraid, pretty often. And the bottom right-hand picture, I don't find useful at all. So, um, so all in all, this looks like a, a healthy um, regression from, from a standard um, Frequentis point of view. And I see we've reached time for our next break. So we'll stop now and start again at 4 o'clock. <laughs>